Hello again. In this video, we will learn more about brands and branding. we need to be consistent with the brand values of the parent brand. Therefore, branding and brand positioning can be the consistency glow that will hold all the elements of the marketing mix together. So what is a brand? Brand is a name, term, sign, symbol, design, or a combination of these. Brand is what identifies the products or services of one seller or group of sellers and differentiate them from those of competitors. Brands what are what makes, makes consumers pay attention to products. Brands can be recognized by the following branding elements, a name, logo, and slogan. Let's consider this on this, on this example of Dac Hoyer, a luxury brand. Consider how different elements of the slogan emphasize the country of origin, personality of the brand, and the perception of luxuriousness associated with the term brand heritage. Think how those elements are likely to appeal to different consumers. Remember, we discussed this in the consumer behavior lecture. So how do we develop and promote brands? When developing brands, managers often start with building something we call consumer brand equity. Consumer brand equity is the incremental value that a brand adds to a product. This is the amount of money someone is willing to pay for a product because it has a brand name on it. To appeal to consumers this way, a brand must reflect values that are very important to a target audience. Please note, Consumer brand equity is different from brand value, which simply measures the total financial value of the brand. There is a couple of consumer-based processes a brand has to impact in order to build consumer brand equity. First, a brand should establish brand awareness among, among the target audience. Brand awareness is the strength of a brand's presence in a consumer mind. Brand awareness can be measured as brand recall or brand recognition. Brand recall is when a consumer is able to give you a brand name when you ask for a brand in a specific product category. For instance, when you ask someone to name their favorite watch brand, the brand that someone mentions without probing or without you asking is the first recalled brand. Brand recognition is a similar concept, but it is measured in a different way. When you ask someone about brands within a specific product category, here you can list different brands and ask whether consumers are aware of it or not. Because you already list different brands, it is likely that you will create more positive response about the brands you ask for, simply because by asking about these brands, you remind consumers about this. Therefore, in general, brand recognition will be higher than brand recall. So if you measure this as percentages, brand recognition will give you slightly higher percentage than brand recall. In general, having brand recall is considered to be a better outcome for branding efforts compared to brand recognition. A dream come true for a brand is to be the top of mind brand for their target audience within a specific product category. Top of mind brand is the first brand a consumer will recall when asked about the brand within a specific category, product category. For example, currently in the UK, Apple is likely to be top of mind brand for many consumers shopping for mobile phones.
Another thing we need to do to establish consumer brand equity is to establish brand associations. Brand associations are various meanings surrounding a brand. To establish a meaning for a brand, we need to position, this, position it in a certain way in consumers' minds. Brand positioning must be, meaning, must be meaningful to the targeted consumer and distinct from competitors. Brand positioning should help to reflect brand personality, which is a set of human characteristics associated with a given brand. Do you remember how we discussed how personality affects human preferences? Here you can see how different brands, for example, Budweiser, could capitalize on positioning of the brand as happy, friendly, outgoing, and cheer cheerful, and thus fitting with the extrovert personality. Another thing we need to establish in order to build consumer brand equity is creating perception of perceived quality. Perceived quality is how consumers subjectively evaluate a product or service quality. Quality can be measured against the following criteria. Reliability, assurance, tangibility, empathy, and response. Please take your time to have a look and read what each of the factors of the criteria mean. Bear in mind, these are predominantly used in relation to evaluation of service quality. However, this can also apply to products. To help you understand this concept, I have prepared our lecture activity for this week in relation to service um, quality criteria. Do you remember lecture activity in relation to the CV lecture or consumer behavior lecture when you worked on search criteria for BMW X3? Imagine the BMW marketing director wants to make sure the car brochure first speaks to people your age and second conveys quality measures that are important for you as a passenger of such a car family car. Here, the main task the BMW manager wants you to do is to ensure the promotional material speak to people similar to you who could act as potential influencers to the purchase decision in relation to such a car. Again, please go back to the consumer behavior lecture if you're not, just to make sure you understand the task better. So, with all these considerations, Please list three top criteria that, would use, that you would use to evaluate the quality of BMW X3. Explain your answer in relation to the service quality criteria you saw on the previous slide. Please post your answer to the class activity week 5 in the MS Microsoft Teams space. Brand loyalty is another important consumer response we need to create in order to build consumer brand equity. Brand loyalty means that consumer is likely to come back to the brand and engage in purchase and repeat purchase behavior. However, brand loyalty is not very easy to define or build. Please consider the following shoppers. Would you be able to rank these in order of the most loyal? As you read about those four different shoppers, you will probably struggle to rank or them, them in terms of the, who is most loyal. Obviously, Michelle is the least loyal, but the order of the other three is less obvious. From a behavioral perspective, it will be Joe, but he has a bad attitude and spreads negative word of mouth, which could hurt the brand. Ibrahim has longevity with the brand, despite shopping around at competitor stores. He has a strong balance of behavioral 
and attitudinal loyalty. This leads, us, this leads us to the slide where you can see the classification of consumers based on the behavioral and attitudinal loyalty. Just like we segmented individuals based on age or another types of variables, we can segment them based on the propensity to be loyal to a brand. Consequently, based on attitudinal and behavioral variables, we can categorize potential consumers into four different groups. So we can have those showing no loyalty to a brand, those showing latent, spurious, or true loyalty. We discussed some of the important perceptions and consumer-based processes that need to be affected in order to create consumer brand equity. Now, Let's just consider why would a company do that. First, brands can, brand can act as a decision-making heuristic. When brands say something about product quality, trustworthiness, or amount of risk associated with the product and brand purchase. Consumers can also gain some psychological rewards when they are seen as attached to or associated with a given brand by their social circles or group groups. To follow up on this idea, brands can act as social signaling device. When brand association help, helps consumer to stand out from others or fit in with others. Developing brands is also beneficial for businesses. The financial value of the companies can be greatly enhanced by the possession of strong brands. Strong brand names can have positive effects on consumer perceptions and preferences, which can lead to brand loyalty. Branding, if successful, can make it difficult for new brands to compete. Strong market leading brands are rarely the cheapest. For instance, Coca-Cola, Apple, Intel, Kellogg's are associated with premium prices. So a good branding translates into profits. Finally, having a strong brand opens opportunities to launch new product categories under the established brand names. Watch the video I added to the Spark, uh, to Adobe Spark page, as it will help you to understand the concept of brand extension better. Now, let's see how we can manage brands. Bear in mind, there are different types of brands and managing these will require different strategies. The main objective of such strategies is to capitalize on and strengthen consumer brand equity and consequently the financial value associated with a brand. Okay, there are different brand strategies we can use and mainly those brand strategies rely on building or capitalizing on existing brands. So as you can see here, we can capitalize on existing brands. Um, so one way to capitalize on existing brands is to launch a line extension. So line extension is the good example here is Coca-Cola which um, offers different types of drinks under the same brand, Coca-Cola. Um, brand extension is another category, is another branding strategy where we use existing brands and we offer product in the new product category. So for instance, Clorks um, was an established brand name in the category of cleaners and launching a brand extension in the product category of toilet bleach or toilet cleaner was a good branding strategy to gain new or to, to target new segment, new audiences. Corporate branding, uh, good so corporate branding uses existing brand name. Uh, for instance, here, 
Apple is a good example, to use corporate branding across all of the products that are offered by the company. Then we can have uh, multi-brands. So very often, there we, this we, uh, multi-brands is offering uh, different brands or using different brands to differentiate between products in existing in the same product category. So for instance, here, you can have one company that owns different fashion brands and actually are able to target different, different audiences simply because of the new brands or different brands uh, that have slightly different positioning and, I, I, and are able to target different audiences. Then uh, we can also have new brands. So that is when we create new brands with a new product category. So for instance, here, a delivery is a very good example uh, because um, it's a new, well, it's a relatively new brand created to uh, provide service of delivery and delivering different um, or delivering restaurant products or restaurant food from restaurants to consumers. Um, then we can have global and local branding. So TK Maxx or TJ Maxx is a very good example. So uh, TJ Maxx is an American company that operates under TJ Maxx um, logo or brand in the US. However, in Europe, because uh, TJ Maxx might be a bit difficult to pronounce in all of the European countries, the brand operates under TK Maxx. Then we can have endorsement branding. That's when we have two brands um, cooperating together. That can be very often for a short amount of time. So here you have an example of a yogurt uh, endorsed by the Olympic team, the UK Olympic team. We can have ingredient branding. So that's when we can have ingredients in a given product uh, being branded on its own. So we can have Intel Inside and Gore-Tex, that's a fabric. Uh, that is used by many um, outdoor clothing manufacturers. And we can have co-branding. Usually that's a simple, single product lines that are offered as a result of cooperation between different uh, different brands. So for instance, Versace and, and Age and M, uh, they launch a line together and then you can have different examples here. So now you know how to capitalize on brand equity um, by deploying appropriate brand strategies. Now we need to also consider how to manage brand investment. This could, this could be especially useful for multi-brands or, or companies managing a large brand portfolios. In general, brands can be grouped into four types depending on market share and market growth. This gives us br brand categorization that can help investors or brand managers to manage their portfolio based on potential growth opportunities. And this gives us different financial decisions that we could actually undertake. So we can actually decide whether we might want to get rid of uh, brands categorized as dogs so that funds can be invested in other products. When we deal with problem child or question marks, we might need to uh, again make the decision whether we need to whether to reduce uh, or divest uh, investment in those brands, or whether we want to invest more and try to help those brands move into the star category. When we have um, brands categorize our stars or cash cows, we need to decide whether to invest uh, more uh, in those brands. In general, cash cows might be also tricky because you might actually, as an as a investor, you might need to decide between um, harvesting or investing. So harvesting means reducing the investment and enjoy positive cash flow and maximize the profits. That's in the situation or under conditions when you believe that um, 
the market growth is you're not able to to get higher market growth okay so you need to consider those different levels of market growth and market share and then decide how to invest in general stars if you under if you have brands that you categorize as stars these are the clear decisions these are the clearly those that you want to invest in So now you have a good understanding of how to build and manage brands. Let's see why it is important to do those things. It is simply because of the financial value associated with the, with the brands. Let's take a look at some of the most recent examples of most valuable brands. Now consider the brand value of the 25 most valuable brands in the year 2020, and this is a million of US dollars. Now consider the Barclays Premier League team brand values and that um, in years 2011 to 2020, and again, this is measured in a million of US dollars. Finally, this is a table with uh, leading brands that have noticed the largest brand value change uh, in the current year 2020. If some of the brands, if there are brands here that you're not familiar with, I encourage you to uh, Google or search our library uh, to understand those brands better. And this is the final slides of our branding, branding lecture. Um, Thank you for watching and see you soon. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Rachel. And hi, everybody. Um, thanks for watching. So just to introduce us, firstly, um, I'm Chris Gibson. Um, I am the University of Manchester's International Officer um, for Peru. Um, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Rachel Tuft from uh, Alliance Manchester Business School. Say hi, Rachel. Hi, everybody. Um, and we're going to quickly take some questions, I think. Sorry, Rachel, were you about to say something? No. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, we, we, we're going to take some questions now from you guys very quickly before the session moves on. So if you have any questions for me or for Rachel, um, just pop them in the comments and we'll be able to answer. It looks like we've got a question already from Nadia. So Nadia is asking, how, brand, how do brands have to change strategy for, for the pandemic? Do you, do you have any ideas on that, Rachel? Um, it's a very good question. Um, I'm, ge I'm guessing that during the pandemic, brands have had to really evaluate um, their positions. They've had to adapt quickly, um, especially in terms of corporate reputation, um, to being more emotionally intelligent um, and to being um, very responsive to the needs of their um, customers, but also being being seen to be responsive to the pandemic in whatever um, brand category they operate in. Great answer to a great question. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Um, I th yeah, I think that's definitely true. We can see brands trying to be more kind of socially aware and more more responsible. So thanks, Nadia. Hopefully that answers your question. If anybody else has any questions, do just pop them in the comments. Um, we can also answer questions if anybody is interested in um, in studying at Alliance Manchester Business School. If you want to know anything about the courses that we offer. Um, Rachel and I can answer those types of questions as well. So do just pop them in the comments um, if you have any. Maybe I should say just a little bit about what we offer at um, Alliance Manchester Business School. So we've got five different undergraduate programmes on offer. Um, our biggest programme is our Bachelor in Management. On our BSc in Management, uh, you can specialise in marketing in your second and third year. Um, so this lecture is taken from one of our BSc management um, marketing um, lectures. Um, not only can you um, specialise on BSc management, you can also um, have a year of industrial experience. So you can spend a year working during your course. So that would make it a four-year course. Um, 
The other masters that we offer, sorry, the other bachelors that we offer that are very popular are um, bachelors in international business, finance and economics, uh, which also has a general first year, but then you can specialize in year two and year three. You can also do a year of work placement with that course. There's another question. I'll just run through quickly the other three courses that we offer. So we also offer a BSc Business Accounting, which you can uh, have work placements with, a BSc Accounting and a BSc IT Management for Business. So we've got another question come in. Uh, could you help me with the examples or brand on brand extension or line extension? Um, so um, in terms of um, line extension, the, the example being given there in the lecture was of the brand was Coca-Cola and the line extension would be um, to Coke Zero, Cherry Coke, Diet Coke. Those are all examples of, of line extensions of brands. Um, the um, other example of brand extension was given um, with the cleaning product. So there was one cleaning product um, under the brand, I think it was Cortex. Um, and then there were two different types of cleaning products. So there was a cleaning product for washing clothes, I think. And the other two cleaning products were looked like window cleaner to me. Um, yes, so that would be an example of brand extension. Brilliant. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks for having stuff. For example, Google Glasses, it has a kind of brand extension. I, yeah, I guess so. I can see you nodding, Rachel. Yeah. Is that right? You're the, you're the expert in this area, not me. <laughs> yeah, I would say. Yeah, I would say Google Glasses is a brand extension. So where they'd come up with another another product, but using the same brand family. Fantastic. Um, and as ever, continue to post your comments at the bottom for us, guys. Okay, there is one here. Um, Claudia asking, how can I study marketing at University of Manchester? Are the entry requirements pretty high? Um, yes, they are quite high. So the audience today that we're talking to um, for NCUK International Foundation years, we're looking for um, three A's. You, maths must be taken as a subject module, um, plus you're going to require um, an English profici proficiency, the EAP test. And we're looking for a grade A overall with writing and speaking at grade A and listening and reading at grade B. So uh, Raoul's asked, um, why should I study marketing in Manchester? It's a very good question. Um, so I would say that um, one of the reasons to come and study at Manchester is that um, in the business school, our business school is called Alliance Manchester Business School. We were the joint first business school to be founded in the UK. So we've got a long track record of uh, running business courses and business expertise. And we do have, um, we don't just have one or two marketing uh, professors and lecturers. We've got a large marketing group um, with the almost probably um, between 40 and 50 um, marketing lecturers and professors who will be teaching you. These teachers are also at the top of their game in terms of international research and um, presenting at international conferences. They're not just uh, UK professors, we are marketing team. In fact, all of our academics in the business school are all international, um, coming from very many different countries as well as the UK. So it's a, we're a highly ranked institution as well. The University of Manchester is ranked number 27 in the world. Um, at MSc, at master's level, our MSc in marketing is ranked in the top 10 in the world. So um, individual bachelor courses aren't ranked in the same way, but you can see that you're coming to a really international institution, well ranked. Plus, we're also triple accredited by the three international <coughs> business school accrediting um, bodies. Thanks, Rachel. You mentioned diversity, um, and I just want to kind of pull one point out of that for the for the Peruanos who are watching us, um, which is that we have a really strong community of Latin American students at Manchester. 
Um, there are about 200, 250 Latin American students from all over Latin America. So we've got students from Mexico, students from Peru, students from Colombia. Um, and right now, I believe we have about 28 or 30 Peruvian students registered with us. Um, so you'd be joining a really strong community of Latin Americans in a very diverse student environment. So we have about 13,000 international students altogether at the moment. Um, so there's a lot of international students studying in one place um, and a very kind of healthy population of Latin Americans that you could, uh, you, so, so it's a, a really great kind of community to, uh, to be a part of. But I think we've got a couple of other questions. Um, Diego's asking about the Lamborghini Urus SUV. Is that a case of brand, uh, brand extension? I guess that's a Lion extent, extension, right? Have yeah. I understood that correctly? I would, I'm, I have to hold my hands up, Diego. I'm not completely familiar with Lamborghinis. So <laughs> I would, yeah, I would take Chris's punt on that. Yeah, no worries. Um, Isa is asking, do we offer any exchange programs for pre-graduate? So I'm guessing that... Um, no. Okay. Um, I, don't think, I don't think so. Can you think of anything? No, I mean, I, I, I guess for pre, because sometimes in Latin, Latin America, we're talking about pre graduate, we're talking about the undergraduate degree. So you do offer, stu do you offer study abroad as part of the. the oh, right. Um, yes, um, actually, um, we do. We have a, a BSc international management, uh, which you can spend um, a year abroad on. Um, but I think also uh, you can do a semester abroad on other subjects as well. Okay, fantastic, great. Um, and Gianna, Gianna is asking, can students apply for scholarships? That's a question we get quite a lot. Yeah, so um, in the business school, um, we do have um, two small scholarships available. Um, these are both by competition. Um, once you've been offered a place on the programme, um, we would, in, if you, um, we would invite you to apply for these scholarships, and you need to write an essay. So the, one is um, our Stella scholarship, um, and one is our um, Social Responsibility scholarship. So for the Social Responsibility scholarship, uh, you need to show um, that you've been involved in a community project or um, something outside of your studies. But uh, for both of these, they're both worth, um, I think, in the region of uh, £2,000 or maybe uh, $2,500 um, per year. Uh, they're both awarded after you've been um, accepted onto the programme. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, so the business school, I guess, is... is um is unusual in that way you guys do have some scholarships not many of our departments in Manchester have that many scholarships so business schools are really good uh, example of where, where there are some scholarships for as they available to Latin American students um, Andrea is asking uh, a very subjective question what what do you consider to be the best brand what's your favorite brand Rachel is it Apple <laughs> actually no no I'm more of a Samsung person myself I, I use both. I'm using a Mac right now, but I also have a Samsung phone. So there yeah. you go. Um, not not brand loyal, apparently. Um, no. here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it looks like possibly we're coming to the end of the questions, unless anybody has any more. Um, but hopefully this the, the, the uh, lecture has given you guys a, a flavour of what it's like to study um, at the University of Manchester, at Alliance of Manchester Business School. Rachel's given us some really um, useful information about the different uh, degree programs that are available to you um, once you've completed the NCUK International Foundation year. Um, yes, the entry requirements are fairly high, but that's because um, Alliance Manchester Business School is one of the one of the kind of most prestigious business schools in in, in the UK um, for the reasons that Rachel outlined earlier. Um, so is there anything else that you want to add? Any final words, Rachel, before we kind of conclude the questions portion? Um, I would just urge everyone to um, come and check out our website. Um, so you can come by the University of Manchester to the Alliance um, Manchester Business School website, um, or you can come directly to us. Um, it's alliancembs.ac.uk, um, or if you Google Alliance Manchester Business School, you'll find us. Um, we've got a fantastic new building and facilities, and there's a really good um, fly-through video of our facilities. 
Um, whilst most of us are working from home at the moment, uh, today I know uh, I have colleagues on campus and apparently the business school is very busy with students using all our lovely facilities in the new business school. So um, I'd urge you to come onto the website and have a look. Absolutely. Thanks, Rachel. There was just one more thing that we did recently sure. called um, an undergraduate open day and there are videos um, done by all of our uh, program directors available on the open day uh, website for you to watch back so you can find out even more about our courses. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Rachel. And if any of you guys are, are studying the International Foundation Year already, I can share those um, those materials with the staff at UPC so that they can share them with you. Um, anybody who's just finding out about Manchester for the first time, absolutely, as Rachel says, um, go to our website. Um, you can find it very easily with a Google search, very easy to find Alliance Manchester Business School. Um, but yeah, otherwise, I think we have reached the end of our question. So thank you so much for joining us, Rachel, and for bringing your um, interesting lecture on branding with you. That was re really useful. Um, and yeah, goodbye from us. We will hand back over to uh, the staff room of Bessé to continue with the session at this point. So thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Hi, my name is uh, Chris Gibson. I'm an international officer at the University of Manchester and I've come from uh, Manchester in the UK. Manchester is located in the northwest of England, um, which is a really cheap place to live. It's also very well connected. Um, so Manchester is one of the top uh, 50 universities in the world. It's number 29 in the world at the moment. And we're also a really well respected university in terms of employability. Manchester is currently the number one most targeted university in the UK by top employers so we're a really well respected university. I'm really excited to be visiting UPC at the moment because of our special relationship with NCUK who have sent us um, who's, some of whose students we're expecting in Manchester in um, September. I'd like to invite everyone who would like to come to the UK to come to UPC to study the NCUK programme and then come to, uh, to us in Manchester. Hola, ¿qué tal? Bienvenidos. Muchas gracias por conectarse. Acabamos de escuchar una, como un, un lecture de, de la Universidad de Manchester y esta universidad pertenece al consorcio de MCUK y el día de hoy estamos con eh, un alumno, ex alumno de MCUK que progresó a la Universidad de Manchester, él es Matías Díaz. Hola Mati. Hola, hola Mati, ¿qué tal? Buenas tardes. Qué bueno verte Buenas tardes de nuevo. Acá. Buenos días para ustedes. Eh, estamos muy emocionados de poder conversar contigo el día de hoy y que nos ayudes a aclarar algunas dudas, tal vez que algunos alumnos están teniendo. Entonces, eh, nosotros hemos recopilado una lista de preguntas, así que voy a empezar a hacértelas para no hacer más larga esta sesión. La primera pregunta es... ¿Cómo te ayudó NCUK para progresar a la Universidad de Manchester? Bueno, uno, primero, el, la primera gran ayuda, diría para mí, fue todo lo que fue la logística de UCAS, de la plataforma para aplicar, que es el equivalente a lo que es el Common Application en Estados Unidos. Eh, desde el comienzo, Patty dijo, chicos, ustedes denme todos los documentos, yo me encargo de todo. Y, y ahí quedó nosotros para UCAS, después sí hubo sí, sí, una demora, pero ese fue por un tema de NCUK de NCUK de Manchester, en cuanto al, a cuando ya se mandaba la aplicación oficialmente a UCAS. Pero después de eso, todo bien. Y Patti, mientras nos iban llegando las ofertas, nos iba asesorando los siguientes pasos. Y ya, eso. Y lo segundo fue la preparación. Justo eso estaba hablando con mis amigos en CUK, porque somos cuatro alumnos en CUK este año, acá, que es del, del año pasado, que estuvimos en NCUK el año pasado. Y la preparación fue, el NCUK fue el mejor de la que tienen los alumnos de IB. Por ejemplo, yo hasta finales de octubre no vi nada nuevo. Vi todo lo que, todos los temas que había en mis clases era, era un repaso de lo que había visto en NCUK. Uh -huh. O sea, ¿podrías decir que las clases te sirvieron mucho para tener una base muy consistente muy para, para que puedas empezar tus estudios allá? Claro, 
Bueno, la siguiente pregunta es, ¿cómo decidiste estudiar en UK? Bueno, esta es una decisión que tomé en el 2018, porque yo salí de un colegio que tenía IB, yo soy alumno, exalumno del Newton, y tenía la opción de hacer IB o de hacer en UK. Si hacía IB, iba a apuntar a la Universidad de Canadá o Estados Unidos, pero en UK me ofrecía cursos que me parecían más interesantes y más dirigidos a mi carrera. Y es por eso que me llamó la atención el programa y en cuanto a estudiar en UK, yo, ya, yo ya, eh, había venido varias veces a UK con mis papás y me pareció un país recontra interesante, bien ordenado, la gente muy civilizada. Y encima, estudiar en Europa para mí era, era lo mejor, porque a mí que me encanta viajar, estoy acá, de acá en Manchester estoy a una hora de... Estoy a, a una hora en vuelo de Londres, estoy a dos horas de Ámsterdam, a dos horas y media de París y a tres horas de Madrid. Y bueno, ahorita no puedo viajar, estoy encerrado, pero una vez se pueda, me encantaría irme un fin de semana a París o a Madrid. Por la, uh -huh. Y acá, por, lo, por los vuelos low cost, es, se puede viajar a, a muy buen precio. Uh -huh. Otra pregunta que hicieron fue, eh, ¿te pareció difícil el Foundation Year? Bueno, dependiendo qué tanto quieras estudiar. Yo el primer, mi primer semestre, honestamente, no estudié mucho. Estudié las dos semanas antes de los midterms. Me fue bien en unos cursos, pero mal en uno. Pero el segundo semestre sí estuve dos meses encerrado en mi casa estudiando, estudiando horas de horas, pero me sentía muy, muy, muy preparado. No me parece difícil, pero sí, si es que no te gusta estudiar, sí se te va a hacer difícil. Uh -huh. Y si, si, no, si no te gusta aprender de una manera independiente, también se te va a hacer difícil. Uh -huh. Aquí yo quisiera um, mencionar o añadir que nosotros como oficina en CUK y en UPC vamos a proveer de todo lo que los alumnos necesiten. Si necesitan eh, tutorías, horas extras, sesiones extras, si necesitan eh, workshops, porque la carrera que, que a la que ustedes quieren postular requiere, por ejemplo, un portafolio. Nosotros vamos a, a proveerles de todo lo que necesiten y depende de cada uno, eh, realmente depende de cada uno llegar a, a, al, al objetivo que se plantee, ¿no? Sí, si es que uno está buscando eh, ingresar a una universidad de Buster Group, pues entonces se va a tener que esforzar el doble pero se logra, así como Matías lo logró, muchos otros de sus compañeros también lo lograron, y es algo que, que sí depende de cada uno, pero no se, no se preocupen que nosotros los vamos a apoyar en todo momento, y, y lo importante es que tengamos tal vez eh, una muy buena comunicación para nosotros poder entender cuáles son sus objetivos y ayudarles de, de una manera más personalizada a cada uno de ustedes, pero sí, de hecho, eh, eh, va a depender de lo que quieran alcanzar y, y ya va, va, va a cabo uno de ustedes, ¿no? Por ejemplo, Patti, ¿sabe cuál era mi obsesión con Manchester? <ríe> sí, y lo logró, finalmente. Sí. Eh, una pregunta relacionada a Manchester es, um, ¿cómo, cuéntanos cómo fue tu experiencia durante tus primeros días allá. Bueno, yo llegué acá bajo un contexto no favorable, prácticamente me tuve que agarrar un vuelo humanitario los primeros días de octubre, este, y con la visa que me llegó dos días antes de mi vuelo, porque fue todo, fue todo un tema, por el tema de la pandemia. Bueno, llegué acá, mis primeros 14 días tuve que, tuve que estar encerrado, pero una vez llegando acá, bueno, el frío me chocó, porque yo no sabía, no sabía que iba a ser tanto frío, el frío me chocó, pero de ahí... Lo que ha sido la adaptación a la comida no ha habido problema. O sea, sí extraño mi pollo a la brasa, mi ceviche, pero... El otro día intenté hacer ceviche y me salió más o menos, pero... Por ahí no es el problema. Eh, el clima ya me adapté. La gente puede ser un poco fría, pero... De hecho, tengo una, una buena vida social acá. Lo único que no me he acostumbrado, honestamente, es la música. <risa> ¿Y te sirvió de alguna manera... Eh conocer compañeros el año pasado que ahora están contigo allá. Sí. Bueno, ya ellos se fueron hace como dos semanas por el tema del nuevo confinamiento, pero sí, sí me sirvió porque varias veces no me he juntado con ellos, hemos salido a comer. 
Y para ver los partidos que... de Perú, sobre todo. ¿Piensas que es como una ventaja de que es tal vez ventaja. estudiando en el NCUK puedes encontrar compañeros que en el futuro vayan a ser tus compañeros de universidad? Sí, por ejemplo, yo estoy con tres, tres compañeros de NCUK acá, pero también tengo amigos que hicieron IB en mi colegio y mm -hmm. se fueron a universidades completamente solos. Y, y estaban más nerviosos, sus papás, eso es lo más importante para mí, sus papás estaban más nerviosos que se estaban yendo solos. Uh -huh. También hay una pregunta acerca de papás. ¿Cómo convenciste a tus papás de estudiar en el extranjero? Mis papás siempre han querido que estudie en el extranjero, mis papás nunca han querido que estudie en Perú. Uh -huh. Lo más difícil fue convencerlos que me dejen venir este año. Okay. Porque eh, su ¿Cómo hiciste? Iba... Uf, tres meses de insistir, insistir todos los días hasta que prácticamente me han querido votar de la casa. <risa> en persistencia, entonces. Persistencia. Y también demostrarles que de alguna manera fuiste re responsable porque digamos que hiciste un muy buen foundation year, demostraste que tenías la capacidad para entrar a una universidad de roster group y eso de todas maneras... Eh, como que en la balanza pesa que hayas mostrado responsabilidad. ¿no? O sea, con mis papás, ellos, ellos, nosotros vinimos el año pasado a ver las universidades y ellos viendo, ellos sabían que después de este viaje yo iba a cambiar mi mentalidad, porque yo antes estaba, yo tenía la mentalidad de quedarme year one, uh -huh. pero una, después de este, este viaje que hicimos el año pasado, ellos me vieron que me había trazado un objetivo y que, y, me, y estaba poniendo toda mi disposición para lograrlo. Me parece que eso, como dice Patti, fue lo más, fue lo que más les hizo aceptar que yo me estaba yendo a vivir a otro país. Uh -huh. Aquí tenemos preguntas de la gente que nos está viendo en vivo. Vamos a comenzar. Dice, ¿qué carrera estudias y por qué elegiste Manchester? Ya, yeah, yo estudio International Business, Finance and Economics. Este, yo escogí Manchester porque es la única universidad que combina esos tres temas. Yo el año pasado tenía un problema porque me gustaba economía, me gustaba business y me gustaba finance. Y, no, y, no, y management me parecía muy, que veía muy ligero lo que es economía y finance me parecía que veía muy ligero lo que es, este, finance me, me parecía que veía muy ligero lo que es business en general. Entonces, Manchester me daba una combinación de los tres y viendo los, los cursos que llevo ahora, me parecía mucho más favorable que otras uh -huh. universidades. Además, porque el business school está muy rankeado, muy bien uh -huh. rankeado, como está, como está explicando, están explicando en la otra presentación. Y el campus es espectacular. Yo, como estaba diciendo Ruth, creo que era, este, yo voy tres veces a la semana al Business School y es espectacular para estudiar. Sí, sí, si es que tienes fotos por ahí nos compartes para también hacer una publicación por ahí con el equipo de marketing internacional. Fiorella nos pregunta, eh, ¿qué obstáculos encontraste? El obstáculo más grande que encontré para entrar a Manchester fue... Creo que mi propia falta de confianza encuentro, encuentro mis estudios a veces. A veces yo no me creí, yo mismo no me creía que podía lograr algo. Uh -huh. Eso fue el único obstáculo que encontré. Uh -huh. eh, luego hasta, ahora, a veces, hasta, hasta ahora a veces no me creo que, que estoy acá. Pero estás. <risa> ahora Yanela nos pregunta, ¿cuántos años son de carrera? Bueno, mi carrera, mi programa está registrado como cuatro años que es tres años más un año en industrial, industrial Experience. Pero si es que yo todavía no me convenzo a hacer Industrial Experience, bueno, falta mucho, pero si es que quisieras hacer solo carrera, son tres años. Uh -huh. ¿Nos podrías explicar qué es el Industrial Experience? Ya, yeah. en la universidad en sí tiene, las empresas van a las universidades para hacer recruit, recruiting, ¿no? Entonces, como estaba explicando, Manchester es muy buena para lo que es employment y la misma universidad te ayuda a conseguir un placement durante tu tercer año. O sea, son cuatro años, tu primero y segundo año son estudios, tercer año haces placement, cuarto año vuelves y te gradúas. Uh -huh. Ya, yeah. la universidad te consigue un placement por un año y eh, en ese placement, es una, como dirían en Lima, 
eh, serías practicante por un año. Uh -huh. Y de ahí, y de ahí claro. eso, te ayuda a conseguir, eso te ayuda a conseguir trabajo después de la universidad. Y de regresas cuarto año, te, eh, terminas, haces tu cuarto año y te gradúas. Uh -huh. Pero para, no, es, no es para todos el Industrial Profession a Year. Te, te piden tener más del 60% de promedio. Uh -huh. Importante, sí. Eh, como decía Matías, la carrera dura tres años, pero si es que le ponemos como que un año in between, de, entre el segundo y el tercero, eh, se hace un año de práctica y es eh, full time, no, no es que lleves cursos a la par. No, Entonces, no es como hacen en Perú que estudias al mismo tiempo que haces tu práctica. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Sí, bueno aclararlo. Ahora, ah, y también bueno aclarar que te pagan por esas prácticas, no son nada. Mm, y te pagan bien. Sí. Eh, a ver, Yanela también pregunta, ¿te convalidan cursos? Bueno, yo entré, yo fui directamente desde secundaria a NCUK y como NCUK es foundation, no me convalidaron ni un curso. El único, no, ni siquiera, porque ni si, iba a decir que me convalidaron inglés, pero ni siquiera, porque me pedían el inglés para entrar. Así que no, no convalidan ni un curso. Sí, eh, esta pregunta está como un poco ambigua, pero vale recalcar que, por ejemplo, si es que has llevado bachillerato internacional en el colegio y quieres estudiar una carrera relacionada a negocios o ingenierías, podrías convalidar todo el Foundation Year y hacer el Year One, que ya es el primer año de los tres años que dura la carrera en UK. Eh, y después, eh, si es que haces el Year One, obviamente te convalidan todos esos cursos que has hecho en el Year One y pasas de frente a tu Year Two. Y solo algunas universidades del consorcio aceptan este, este qualification. Uh -huh. Pueden entrar a la página web de NCUK para que eh, chequen cuáles son estas universidades. Ahora, Macael nos pregunta, ¿considerarías a Manchester un lugar bohemio? Depende. Es que acá en el centro de la ciudad hay varios barrios. Tienes el Chinatown, tienes el Gay Village, tienes Blackfurs. Cada uno tiene como un mood diferente. Entonces, este, no lo consideré tanto bohemio. Tiene partes que sí son no tanto bohemias, pero viejas. Este, pero es una ciudad multicultural, finalmente. Uh -huh. O sea, no te aburres para nada. No te aburres nada. Bueno, ahorita... Bueno, este lockdown ha sido un saludo a la bandera en verdad. Entonces, este, los, fines, los domingos a veces voy al centro a pasear. Uh -huh. Ahora, Franco nos pregunta, ¿cómo se encuentra la situación ahora por allá? Bueno, de la perspectiva de un alumno, no nos ha cambiado nada el lockdown. Lo único que no, ya no podemos ir a los bares. Y igual nos juntamos los fines de semana. Pero ya está bajando. Hace dos semanas que están bajando los casos. Uh -huh, qué bueno. Eh, Yanela nos pregunta, ¿en, C, ¿en qué ciclo de la U vas? Voy en mi, sería, mi, voy en mi primer semestre. Uh -huh. Acabas de comenzar, ¿verdad? En septiembre. Sí, en octubre. En octubre. Uh -huh. Ahora, Yanela otra vez nos pregunta, ¿puedes hacer el programa de NCUK estando en quinto de secundaria? No, eh, el programa de NCUK es una vez terminando el colegio. Uh -huh. Eso es correcto. Terminas quinto y empiezas tu foundation year, que son como los A-levels. Postulas cuando estás en quinto. Uh -huh. Y por último, Drashana nos pregunta, ¿cuál es el nivel de inglés requerido? Bueno, te piden un nivel, no, no, o sea, si lo pudiera en categorías es avanzado, porque tú tienes, como mencionaron, como mencionó Ruth, tú tienes que hacer, un, tú tienes que sacarte A de promedio para, para entrar en EAP, y es tener eh, writing, Uh, writing skills avanzados, oral skills avanzados y reading skills avanzados. Uh -huh. Yo, por ejemplo, y... yo, he estudiado, yo, estudi yo he estudiado inglés desde hace ya 14 años. Entonces, no, yo no tengo ningún problema con el nivel de inglés. Uh -huh. Y con respecto al nivel de inglés requerido para ingresar al programa de NCUK, eh, ¿nos puedes demostrar que tienes un nivel B2? 
Es decir, haber sacado una ah, en la GCC. En, en FCE o B en IGCSEs, eh, o si tienes una C en el CAE, eh, demostrar que tienes un nivel B2. Si es que no has rendido ningún, ninguna eh, certificación, no, no, es, no es necesario que, que la tomes para ingresar en CUK, simplemente nosotros te, eh, ofrecemos que, que rindas el password test, que no es ninguna certificación, pero es un examen que nos permite a nosotros saber que tienes ese nivel mínimo para comenzar todas tus, todos tus cursos en inglés, porque en realidad no, es, no, no, no sería nada justo dejar a ingresar alumnos que no tienen el nivel de inglés adecuado porque la van a sufrir mucho si es que empiezan todos sus cursos en inglés y no están entendiendo. Obviamente no van a sacar buenas notas, ¿no? Entonces, sí es importante tener eh, un mínimo de B2, que es como un upper intermediate. Y, obviamente, ese nivel va, va a ir mejorando durante todo el año. Y ya podrían ten, terminar el programa con un inglés avanzado y, e irse sin ningún problema a cualquier universidad, ya sea en el Reino Unido, Australia, Nueva Zelanda, Canadá, Estados Unidos. Uh -huh. Y con eso... Eh, me parece que hemos terminado la ronda de preguntas. Igual yo quisiera terminar, eh, Mati, preguntándote cuál sería el mejor consejo que le podrías dar a un chico o chica de, que está en quinto secundaria y que está pensando, pero no está seguro si es que quiere estudiar fuera. Bueno, uno es, diría, este, imagínate a ti viviendo solo, porque parece fácil, pero vivir solo, vivir solo en otro país también tiene sus cosas. Yo he tenido la ventaja de que ya conocí este lugar con mis papás y ya y, y conozco varios peruanos que están acá, pero para una persona que vive sola afuera sí puede chocar. Dos, tome en cuenta los, tome en cuenta los costos, porque a veces uno, eso pasó el año pasado, se metían en CUK, pero cuando se dan cuenta de los costos de afuera, medio que se frustraban. Y tres, estudia, estudia duro, estudia un montón. Uh -huh. Bueno, ya escucharon. Eh, es, de hecho, una decisión bastante importante, de las más importantes, creo, en, en la vida. Y, bueno, nosotros estamos aquí para ayudarles. Si es que finalmente ustedes deciden prepararse con nosotros en UPC, en CUK, estamos de verdad muy felices de poder estar ayudando a muchos alumnos como Matías a lograr sus objetivos, ingresar a las mejores universidades del mundo. De hecho, a mí me emociona un montón. Y, y sí, de, eh, estén atentos porque vamos a tener también otras charlas eh, con, con otros alumnos para que vean que no es eh, algo, no sé, inventado, ficticio. No, tenemos alumnos egresados que ya están allá, que están cumpliendo sus sueños, que les está yendo muy bien, que se sienten preparados. Y eso se trata, de que puedan tal vez animarse con estos testimonios. Y por eso te agradecemos mucho, Mati, por tu tiempo. Sabemos que eh, estás estudiando duro allá también y que regalarnos tu tiempo esta mañana, bueno, tarde para ti. Um, noche, ya. Noche, esto, sí. Eh, te agradecemos un montón, esperamos también, eh, tal vez poder conversar en el futuro, a ver cómo te, te sigue yendo, así que gracias a todos por conectarse, y ya saben, sigan las redes de UPC Internacional, en Facebook, Instagram, ahora TikTok, para que puedan enterarse de todos los webinars, todos los webinars, todas las charlas, info sessions, tenemos um, info sessions, de hecho, todas las semanas, lunes, miércoles y viernes, eh, Estefi, me parece que ahí tienes la pieza para, para poder invitar a los chicos. Ahí está, lo pueden ver. Eh, los lunes tenemos info session de Student Support con nuestra PTC Harriet Staff. Eh, los miércoles tenemos eh, info sessions académicos conmigo. Y los viernes tenemos info sessions de admisión. ¿Cuáles son los requisitos? Paso a paso el journey con Rodrigo Matos. Ahí están los horarios y, eh, bueno, están más que bienvenidos a todos ellos y a seguir las redes de UPC Internacional para enterarse de más eventos.
Gracias.